Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While Jesus was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. My favor rests on him. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the human one has been raised from the dead. The Gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise Praise to you, Lord Christ. For about eight years, our family lived in the shadow of Mount Diablo, which rises nearly 5,000 feet from flat land and towers over the east and southeast portions of the San Francisco Bay Area. Mount Diablo was named Devil Mountain by the Spaniards, the Spanish colonizers, but to the indigenous people, it was sacred space. Seeing her snow-capped peak as I left the house on winter mornings or watching a huge orange harvest moon rise over her double-peaked silhouette, I couldn't help marveling at the awesomeness of God. In the afternoons, I'd go hiking in her foothills. I remember one particular afternoon when I hiked along a ridge trail that runs right along a crest. Standing at the top, I could see all of the western Diablo Valley and beyond. It seemed all of creation was spread out before me, and I stood there a long time in awe and thanksgiving before I began my descent. The buildings, the cars, they were so far away they seemed insignificant. Only this lovely place where God was so near, this place that was sacred to the native people who lived in the Diablo Valley for thousands of years, was real in that moment. Now, for all the wonder of being there on the mountain, I don't do well with heights. I'm fine as long as there are trees or, you know, even brush along the side of the trail. But with the wind on my face and nothing but a few clumps of dead grass on the bare hillside, suddenly it was all I could do to ignore my sense of panic and put one foot in front of the other. I could feel myself starting to tremble and felt fresh sweat forming on my face. I had to keep reminding myself that this wasn't reasonable. I hiked frequently along trails that were narrower and more difficult. So I pulled my hat down over one side of my face so that I wouldn't see the drop off. And then as I reached the first switchback in the trail, a hawk that had been soaring high above just swooped down right to my level. And I completely forgot my fear as the hawk wheeled around and flew straight toward me, finally altering its course to pass just a few feet from my face. Sunlight glinted off gold-streaked winds. And for just a few moments, I could see the detail of its face and looked right into its eye. Far down below, a coyote wandered back and forth across the trail. I'd seen that coyote many times before, but always I was much nearer and she knew I was watching her. Now, standing high up on another hill, I was too far away to seem threatening to her or her pups. 
and I watched until she disappeared into the brush. Standing there on the side of the hill, I could only thank God for allowing me the wonder of that moment. It's no wonder that mountains are places of mystery and power for people of different faith traditions across the world. As the wind whistles through the trees and we look down on the vastness of creation and up into endless sky, how can we not feel the awesomeness of God and how can we not realize our own utter insignificance? And I wonder, where is it? Where is it that you feel the awesomeness of God? Where do you experience that? It might not always be mountaintops. Anyone have another place? The ocean. The ocean, yeah. Yeah, and that's actually, uh, you know, let means spring, and uh, it's about what's growing beneath the ground unseen in us. Mountains are wonderful places. High, open, places where we're exposed and vulnerable. Mountains are not safe places. Mountains are places of possibility, their, their liminal space, places a threshold between the physical and the spiritual, between the what is and what might be. Mountains are thin places. In biblical tradition, mountains were places where people met and experienced God. It seems likely, do I need to stop? No. no it seems likely that Jesus had just come to realize the nearness of his death. Sometimes it's hard for us to let Jesus be too human. We'd rather he knew all the law and exactly what would happen, like the script he'd studied in advance. It's so much easier to imagine it that way. If Jesus knows exactly what's going to happen from moment to moment, then we are spared the very real, very human feelings about his death. Yes, Jesus willingly suffered and died, but he didn't want to suffer and die. Up until his arrest, he hoped and prayed that there would be another way. And so, having realized that his ministry had trudged toward Jerusalem and the cross, Jesus went to a high mountain, a place where he could pray and grapple with his future, a place where, like Moses, he would encounter God. It was six days after Moses gave the people instruction that he took Joshua with him up the mountain. And it was on the seventh day that God called out to Moses. After Moses encountered God, his face shone radiantly with what we call in English the glory of God and what the biblical call, people call Shekinah, the manifestation of the presence of God. From that time, Moses' face shone with such radiance he had to wear a veil when he went among the people. It was six days after Jesus had first begun teaching that he would suffer and die, that he took his three closest companions up to a high mountain. The way Matthew tells the story, the transfiguration itself occurs on the seventh day. Jesus' face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. And then there he was talking with Moses and Elijah. There are parallels between Moses and Jesus throughout Matthew, beginning with the story of Jesus' birth and the name of his father. Now with Peter, James, and John, we see Jesus in conversation with Moses, bringer of God's law, and Elijah, Israel's high prophet. They speak as equals, and Jesus clearly has Moses and Elijah's stamp of approval. Peter's reaction was to want to stay in that place of awe and wonder. I wonder, has that happened to you? It's happened to me. Have you experienced times when you just wanted to stay where you were and not have to get on with 
your responsibilities or real life when you just wanted things as they were not to end? Probably all have the experience of our kids being in that place, right? Can't I just stay a little longer? Sometimes we experience that in the morning. Uh, <laughs> can't I just stay here a little longer? Mm -hmm. But we, we, I think we all have those moments where we want to stay there uh, in, in a moment of awe and wonder or in a moment of <coughs> comfort. And it's, that's an interesting thing. I don't know if you noticed, but often it sounds like Jesus hurried them on down the mountain. But in fact, there's nothing that says anything about how long they stayed in that place. We need to stay in places of awe and wonder as long as we need to stay there. Sometimes we can't. But the next thing that happens is that Peter, James, and John hear a voice proclaim, this is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. We've heard that voice before. We heard it when Jesus em emerged from the waters of baptism. A heavenly voice used those same words. They are the bookends, I mentioned, of the epiphany, epiphany season, the aha season. Now those words are directed to Jesus' most intimate followers. You can almost feel a change in the pace of things when they hear the voice of God from the cloud. The accent changes, and the three disciples drop to the ground, overwhelmed by fear. Jesus responds the way Jesus always does when people are confused and afraid. He reaches out to them and touches them gently and reassures them. Now, uh, I want to be clear because it comes up in, uh, in the most unexpected times. Jesus keeps touching his disciples, but remember, they're already close friends. They have that level of intimacy. He's not just going off and touching strangers. He's touching people who trust him who have intimate relationship with him. And he reaches out to them, he touches them gently, he reassures them, responding with compassion. Matthew paints him as God's beloved, God's chosen, in the tradition of the greatest prophets, and very much human, filled with that compassion. Some of us know personally what it is to be overwhelmed and the news has been full of people overwhelmed by fear. People, people in Ukraine, uh, people in Turkey and Syria. Just a few days ago, a Michigan colleague told a few of us uh, of being on the phone for hours with an MSU student who was locked down in her dorm room alone, not knowing where the gunman was. And reassuring the student that God was with her, reminding her that she had talked with her mother just a few minutes ago, being present with her in that place of fear. When we're in that place of overwhelming fear, we need to know that God is with us and for us. God is out to get us, that God is there to touch us at our core transform us. God doesn't leave us alone, even in the most terrifying of situations. And God doesn't let us go. After Peter's outburst the week before, when Peter had insisted that Jesus must not be crucified, Jesus realized just how difficult it was going to be for them. He didn't sit around considering how Peter's faith just wasn't as strong as it ought to be. Instead, Jesus found a way to meet Peter and James and John. They had their own issues where they were. Where they were. The Transfiguration was not an event designed to meet us today 
where we are. Matthew's showing us how Jesus met his followers where they were in their own very Jewish context. All the symbols in that story were things they would have understood without even thinking about them. So from Matthew's account, Jesus had seen to every detail. Both the Exodus and Matthew lessons tell how God breaks in upon our world and how God comes to all of us. We can't meet God where God is. And so God comes to us. It happened to Moses on Mount Sinai. It happened again at the Transfiguration. It happened at the birth of Jesus, the Christ. God meets us where we are with symbols we can understand to overcome our brokenness and restore wholeness, restore to wholeness the relationship between us and God. Even though that, that experience was intended specifically for those Jewish disciples, early Christian communities struggled with the same kinds of issues about their people that the disciples struggled with now that they had heard what was going to happen next. Matthew's community had come to realize that following Jesus meant following him into death and supporting him along the way. And like Peter, James, and John, they were overwhelmed by fear. Well, it was important for Matthew's community to realize that Jesus' closest companions were every bit as terrified and that Jesus himself wanted to find another way. They were overwhelmed by fear. It isn't possible to participate in Jesus' transfiguration without being transformed in the process. After Jesus touched Peter, James, and John, they heard his words of assurance, and they looked up and they saw nothing but Jesus alone. Think about that. They saw nothing but Jesus alone. When the time was right, James and John did follow Jesus back down the mountain and continued to see Jesus alone. That had become their focus. And despite stumbling along the way, Peter, James, and John continued to be transformed by God's grace and did follow Jesus into death. Matthew wanted this community to realize that the same God who transformed the lives of those first disciples and raised Jesus from the dead would continue to transform them as well. Most of us here this morning are not likely to have to follow Jesus into literal death, into literal martyrdom, as so many of his disciples throughout the world did and still do. But we are called to follow him. And the way is often not the way we would choose for ourselves or for our congregations. In fact, sometimes it's pretty uncomfortable. Our reaction when we're called to put our lives or even our comfort at risk may sometimes be similar to that of Peter, James, and John up on the mountaintop. It's so good to be here with you, Jesus. We'll build a house of worship for you here, and we'll put all our effort into taking care of it. We'll make our house of worship a place where we can be comfortable staying with you. Of course, there's nothing wrong with doing any of that. But it turns out God isn't interested in transforming buildings. In fact, as we've heard over the past couple of weeks, and we'll hear again on Wednesday, God doesn't care about buildings at all, except as they serve as a refuge for those in trouble. God wants to transform people, to fill their hearts with compassion and care for their neighbor. God wants to transform people so they are willing to follow Jesus into uncomfortable, even risk-filled situations for the sake of those who suffer injustice or loneliness or hurt. Life is filled with transforming experience 
of death and resurrection. Again and again, we ascend the mountain and descend to whatever our own context may be at the time, and it's, it changes as the world turns and different things happen and we grow older. And we are constantly being transformed into the likeness of Christ to be agents of transformation in the world. As we, as we end our epiphany season and approach Ash Wednesday, here is what I would like you to think about. Peter, James, and John were transformed and saw nothing but Jesus alone. What would it be like for you to be so focused that you saw nothing but Jesus alone? What would it be like for the people of Lutheran Church of Christ the King to see nothing but Jesus 